Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Todd Clint's SharePoint Podcast number 241, recorded live on March 30th, 2015. I am your host, your very grateful and gracious host, Todd Clint. And as always, this stunning broadcast in its entirety in Technicolor and all that was brought to you by the folks at Rackspace. And you can find out about all the great SharePoint things we do at Rackspace by going to sharepoint.rackspace.com here in the lower third as I try to... Uh, sharepoint.rackspace.com get on there, order you some cool SharePoint stuff, it'll be a hoot, your friends will be jealous, your enemies will be amazed Uh, sharepoint.rackspace.com on to production notes tonight's production notes have a lot of things in here Uh, so last week was the podcast with Mark Manassi and that went pretty well, Mark was in a hotel room he was very gracious, he thought he was going to be home for that, but he was not uh, the hotel internet w- worked okay after a while, after we got things warmed up, so that was pretty good. Uh, thanks again to Mark. The coloring last week was weird, and that's because I screwed up a setting on my camera. So one of the things that I uh, do with my camera is I have to shut the auto white balance off, because if I leave the auto white balance on when I turn these lights on, it makes me yellow, like last week. And I was... When Mark and I were playing, I was in there tweaking some stuff and had had turned the white balance back on. So as you can see this week, I look like my normal self. I did not have a jaundice. I do not have jaundice. I am in good shape, but it was just the white balance. So I got that all fixed, but man, it's always something. And that reminds me of the old days back when the production notes was the greater part of the show because of all the things I'd screwed up before. And I hadn't thought about it for a while, but uh, just haven't been a lot of those kind of things lately. But uh, last week was was just that. And if you if you look back at last week's, if you watch the video, you'll see me fooling with the light here on the side. I've got a uh, a light here that lights up the side of my face, and I was fooling with it because I was trying to get the color adjusted, and it was uh, it was not working very well. But uh, everything else was uh, was pretty good. So uh, another thing for the production notes I wanted to bring up is much like yourself, if you're watching this or listening to this, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I listen to them in my car and I pair my Windows phone up and use the substandard Windows phone podcasting app and I got it going through my thing. It's got the, the screen and all that on there. And as I was watching some other podcasts, I noticed that they do their titles and all that kind of stuff a little differently than I do mine. And so I was curious if you guys had any opinion on that. So one of the things that I was thinking about doing was changing the title of the MP3 file. So that's, you know, not the, not the file name, but the, the title tag inside of the MP3 file to be something like just the number, like this one would be uh, you know, like, like hash 241 and then whatever the title turns out to be. And that way, because I noticed uh, on one of them that I was watching, they had a bunch of stuff at the beginning that I already knew. And I used to do that. I used to, the, the, uh, the title used to be Todd Clint's SharePoint, blah, 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 blah. And then somebody said, hey, that's all redundant. But I'm thinking the stuff that I do now is even redundant. So I'm thinking about just putting hashtag the number and then the title and then for the artist, you know, putting Todd Clinton for the album, Todd Clinton SharePoint podcast or something like that. Um, So let me know what you think. I know that the bulk of the people who consume this do it by MP3. I've looked at the downloads, so I know that that's a lot of uh, the people out there. But let me know what you think if you have any opinions on how I can change the title or the artist or the album or whatever I'll uh, I'll do that. I probably will not go back and fix any of the old ones because I listened to a couple of podcasts that have done that, and it forced at least in some cases people's podcast software to re-download them because it didn't uh, match up. So I probably won't do that, but it'll be something I do going forward. And then I assume there's at least two or three of you out there that are keeping all of these and have them in their their MP3 library categorized and all that. And if I change any of this, it'll probably throw that off. I apologize ahead of time. Sorry, mom. But uh, I may end up doing that. But anyway, you can hit me up on Twitter at Todd Clint. Email me, todd.clint at rackspace.com, something like that. And let me know if you have any opinion on how I change my MP3, uh, MP3 tags. Another thing that I was thinking about was changing the time. Last week, I sat in on Bill Bear. So after Bill Bear did my podcast, two or three podcasts ago, I can't remember what it was, he started doing one with the folks at IT Unity. And you can go to itunity.com, and they got all kinds of great stuff. But every other week, Bill does a podcast with them. And it was at like 11.30, 11 Central, I think, something like that. And there's a bunch of people in there, and I thought, um, I wonder if 
people would prefer that mine was during the day because right now it's at 8.30 at night and I got a good crowd in the chat room, a bunch of loyal folks. We get some new folks every now and then. Always good to see folks. But I just I was curious if moving it during the workday, at least in the U.S. workday, would make it easier for people who wanted to join in to join in. Now, I know that that would make it easier for Europeans to join in because right now it's like 1.30, 2.30 in the morning for those guys. This thing is not worth watching at 8.30 at night. It's sure not worth getting up at 2.30 in the morning for. But if I made it earlier in the day, uh, more Europeans might be able to, uh, to jump in. So curious if that's a thing. And I have had a couple of uh, Europeans that have mentioned it, and I've got a couple of Europeans that I want to have on as guests, but again, it's 2.30 in the morning for them, so that's no fun. So let me know what you think, if you've got uh, a solution or a suggestion for a better time that I could do this, or if 8.30 at night is rock solid and the best time possible, that's awesome too. But shoot me a, shoot me a tweet, email, something like that, and let me know uh, what, your, what your thoughts on that are. The final thing that I want to talk about in the production notes is something that is funny. Uh, this is this is a funny thing. So, you know, I work from home, so I don't get a lot of adult interaction during the day. And so I've made friends with some of the other tech nerds here in Ames. And we go out and we have lunch every once in a while. And a month or so ago, we were all having lunch, and one of the guys was talking about how I should get transcripts for my podcast. And I'm like, that is... That is not valuable at all to anybody. And I was thinking that from the fact that it would take me a bunch of time or, or money or both to do all that. And I just didn't think there would be much need for it. So I asked him, what makes you think that that would be valuable to anybody if there was a transcript of my podcast? And he said, have you ever like been on a conference call or a meeting or something and seen a link to an article and clicked it and it was only a video and you cursed them because you couldn't read the text and all there was was the video and you couldn't watch it? And I'm like, oh my God, that happens all the time. I hate, oh, I see what you did there. Uh, so at that point, I decided, yeah, maybe having a transcript of my podcast isn't the dumbest idea that I have ever had. But then I wasn't sure how to do it. I know the Pod Show guys do it. I talked to them a little bit about it, and they've got a service that they use. And I didn't necessarily want to spend any money on it, uh, but still had a kicking around inside my head. And then some folks at CMS Wire reached out to me and offered to do a transcript of my podcast. So it was kind of a weird deal. So I talked to them a couple of weeks ago, and we have kind of a rough idea how we're going to do it. So possibly by the time this uh, this podcast gets blogged, which is normally on Thursday, there will be a link or something in the blog post that will link you to a transcript uh, from CMS wire and it's not going to be the whole thing. It's just going to be pieces of it. Um, you know, the pieces that are actually valuable, but we're kind of get kind of be curious to see, you know, how much effort that is on their side. How many of you guys click it on, on this side? Uh, we're going to, going to be kind of curious about that. So Trevor Seward in the chat room says, doesn't YouTube do auto, uh, closed captioning? It does. I think, though I've not had that be very consistent as to when it does or doesn't do it. And also it does the machine job. You know, it's kind of uh, kind of funny, kind of the English kind of thing. The CMS wire thing, as far as I know, there's actually a, a woman that's going to be doing it. I talked to her a little bit, and I'm like, man, are you sure you want to commit yourself to listening to like 30 to 45 minutes of this crap every week? Oh, my God. I don't know if you're getting punished for something. I don't know if they're trying to, like, work you out. If you're on one of those plans where they're trying to get you to quit because they don't want to fire you, I don't know what's going on. But, but man, think this through. And they uh, they seem on board. They think they, think they want to do it. So I encourage you, if that's something that's valuable when these pop out here, give the guys at CMS Wire uh, some link love and click on that. And then if you've got any feedback on it, how that's all going to work, um, let me know. And one thing that's going to do for me is it's going to require me to tighten things up a little bit. It's going to make me be a little more religious about getting that MP3 file out there sooner, things like that, so that they can get it. And then, you know, I have to send them my notes so they have the, the links and all that. But I think it's going to be a good thing. And again, up until when I had lunch with my buddies, I would have thought it was completely worthless. And then Matt uh, shot that idea about the, the video. So again, always encouraging you to give my feedback give me your feedback, the title, the, you know, the time, any of that kind of stuff. Again, hit me up on Twitter at Todd Clint or email me Todd.Clint at Rackspace.com. 
Now we'll go on to the topics, uh, a bunch of stuff. So I had a few things to talk about last week, and then Mark came on, and all of his stuff was more exciting than the crap I was going to talk about. So now we're kind of doing a little bit of catch-up here. The first thing that I wanted to talk about is the Windows 10 preview, and this is for tablets and computers and all that kind of stuff, it has now been updated. And by now, probably everybody has build 10,041. Last week when I was going to talk about this, it was only for the folks in the fast ring but now I think they've started trickling it out to the slow ring folks also. So let's talk about the rings momentarily before we go on to how uh, some stuff about this update. With Windows 10, with the preview, Microsoft is allowing you to pick how aggressively you get the updates. And this is a really great idea. If you're somebody who wants to be on the cutting edge and see all the greatest stuff immediately, you can put yourself in the fast ring. Or if you're somebody who wants things to be stable, you just don't want to fuss with things much, then you put yourself in the slow ring. And the way updates go out is Microsoft has some internal rings. They've got the canary ring and things like that. And then the first public ring is the fast ring. And the fast ring gets a lot of updates, and it gets them very quickly. And then after the fast ring has tried the updates for a while and done some feedback and all that, if the build is good, then it gets rolled out to the slow ring. And in theory, only good patches, only good solid builds will get pushed out to the slow ring. If you're running Windows 10 Preview uh, and you want to look at the setting or figure out where you're at, go into Settings. And so, you know, you can do the thing. Update and Recovery. And then un, in Update and Recovery, under the Advanced Options, they have a, a drop-down box. How quickly do I want to receive updates, fast ring or slow ring? You can change it. You're not committed one way or the other. But if you're in the fast ring, then you'll get these first. And all of these updates are coming down as Windows updates. So if you make a change to that setting, if you go from the slow ring to the fast ring, then go in and do a Windows update, and you'll get, uh, you'll get all the other updates and whatever the update to the preview is. Um, so that's pretty cool. I think upgrading the preview uh, via Windows Update is an amazing idea and just goes to show how far Windows Update has come in the you know, 15, 20 years we've been using it. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. One of the things, so by now, the ISOs might be out. So if you want to do a fresh install as opposed to an upgrade, a fresh install of 10,041, I think those are out. Those normally come out with the slow ring. So us fast ring folks have had the build for a couple of weeks now, uh, and I think those ISOs might be out now. So there's a few changes, nothing huge, a bunch of bug fixes, obviously. They changed the start screen, and I'm not sure that I'm a fan of that, but one of the complaints that people had with Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 and with Windows 10 was when you went from the desktop to the start screen, it was jarring, this whole big change. So going from 8 to 8.1, one of the things that they did to make it less jarring was give you the ability to put your desktop background behind the start screen. So that all stayed the same. It just looked like the tiles came up. Um, and that helped a little bit, but apparently they got more uh, complaints about the jarringness of the start screen. Boy, that start screen just can't get any respect. Uh, so with Windows 10, what they did was they made the start screen transparent. So when it pops up, you can still see the background, you know, your desktop, whatever's running, but you get the start screen. I find it kind of annoying. I find it kind of tough to see where the start screen stuff is. I prefer if I if I choose the start screen over the start menu, then I want the start screen to be the start screen. I want to see my live tiles. I want to see all that kind of stuff. And I um, so I'm not a fan of that that necessarily. Again, if I don't want the whole start screen jarring things up. Um, then I want, uh, then I'll pick the start menu. So that was one change. Another change they made is to the networking. One of the problems I had with the previous build, then 9481 or whatever it was, was my machines wouldn't auto connect to one of my Wi Fi access points. And so I would have to go and hit the thing, and then a whole big metro screen would come up, and I'd have to pick my wireless network and connect. In, starting in 10,041, the wireless thing is now a flyout. It comes in the notification thing. So now I can just get that and hit it. So that's kind of nice. I like that. They made some changes to the Windows Insider app, and that's where you give them feedback. So that's better. You can you can mark things better. Please leave them feedback. Uh, so some folks in the chat room are talking about stuff about Windows 10. Leave them feedback, good or bad. Let them know what you like. I've done that with a bunch of stuff. I like giving them feedback. They, I mean, that's part, that's part of the agreement. That's part of the contract of playing with the preview build is that you have to give them feedback and help them make the product better. So check out the new Windows Insider Hub and leave them some feedback in that. Um, one other sad note with build 10,041, I got my very first blue screen of death with Windows 10. 
And in the you know the vein of of Windows being more friendly, it actually gives you the little sideways frowny face. <laughs> it doesn't give you the core dump anymore. It actually gives you the colon and the uh, the open paren and says, "Gosh, we feel terrible" or something of that effect. Um, we're writing some stuff to disk. If you want to find out what happened, search for this phrase after your computer comes back up. Um, so I don't know. I can't remember what caused that blue screen of death, but that was uh, that was. F- um, one of the things that they, I don't know, <laughs> they changed. Give Todd the blue screen of death. So anyway, if you're running Windows 10, if you're at the 9481 uh, or whatever, uh, what's going on, if you're in the fast ring or the slow ring, you can go out to Windows Update and get that. Some folks in the chat room are saying that 10,049 is going to be out soon or uh, or might even be out. So I haven't checked my machines in the last couple of days. Somebody else in the chat room, let me see, I can give... Uh, See who that was. Uh, Gabe, Gabe Warden was saying that he can't wait to put it on his Stream 8. So as we all know, I uh, have uh, a love for Windows tablets. I have many of them. They keep me company on the cold winter Iowa nights. And my favorite is this guy here, Dell Venue 8 Pro. I have Windows 10 running on several boxes. I've got it running on a laptop. I have it running on the little infected... uh, HDMI stick. Oh, I was going to tell you guys about that too. I have it running on this little guy right here that's hooked up to a TV. and But I don't have it on any of my tablets for the simple reason that I haven't seen anything in Windows 10 yet that makes me think it would be better on small devices like this than Windows 8.1 is. So I have not put it on any of these devices yet. And I wouldn't recommend that anybody does. Another thing is a bunch of the devices that I have, like uh, like this WinBook here that I've got, which I'm not sure where that's at right now. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's got a 16 gig C drive. Windows 8.1 used a thing called Wim Boot, where Windows 8 would actually boot off of the recovery partition to save space, and I think that worked pretty well. Though that particular one is getting full, I've had a lot of problems with that. But I've been reading some stuff in Windows 10. It doesn't look like it's going to keep Wimboot going forward. They're going to do a thing with uh, compressing system files and things like that. So a bunch of the tablets that I have, if I could get Windows 10 on it, um, it would be very full. So I haven't done it on any of them yet. haven't seen a value to it. Um, but uh, if you guys do do that, let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Oh, uh, another thing that was broke with 1041 that I can confirm I had the same problem is I can't get to any of the properties of any of my network adapters. So if I go into network and adapters, right-click properties, I get unknown error or something like that. And that came up, I needed to change the IP address of one of my adapters. I had to uh, play with that. So it's just the UI that's broken. I was able to do it with PowerShell, and then I was talking to some folks, and... Um, they were able to do it with NetSH because they're not as cool as I am. They weren't using PowerShell. Um, but that's just the UI thing. So if you're using one of these and you can't get to the properties of your adapter, it's a good uh, time to get familiar with the Get Network Adapter uh, and all those kind of uh, PowerShell commandlets. If you want Windows 10, and gosh, I don't know why you wouldn't, it's kind of a two-step process. First, you need to go to insider.windows.com and sign up as a Windows Insider. feels very exclusive, by the way, but anybody can sign up. You don't need to do anything special. Sign up for Windows Insider, and then I think on your Windows 8 thing, you have to install a hotfix or have to install a patch and then run Windows Update, and uh, you will get the Windows 10 preview as part of a Windows update, and it will update your Windows 8 or Windows 7 box right up to Windows 10. So that's kind of cool. Or also, once you get the Windows Insider thing, you can go download the ISOs and do a fresh install. So that's uh, that's how you get that. Again, free. A couple of things that Microsoft has said. Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 8.1 will all upgrade in place to Windows 10 preview. And the Windows 10 preview will upgrade to Windows 10 RTM, which is something new. They've never done that before. So don't be afraid of, you know, having a machine that you use all the time and upgrading that to the preview, thinking you're going to have to wipe it when Windows 10 comes out, because you probably won't have to. The other thing they've said is that if you're running Windows 7 or Windows 8 or Windows 8.1, if you upgrade it to Windows 10 RTM within the first year, you will be able to upgrade it for free. And part of that, again, part of that contract, that pound of flesh, is if you upgrade it, they've said that they're going to keep you updated. So I think you're going to have to agree to getting all the OS updates uh, more quickly. 
So kind of some cool stuff out there, and um, I'm excited. I'm liking it. The Windows 10 stuff's good. Again, not good enough to go on any of my uh, lucky tablets, but uh, but good stuff. Um, so in the same vein, I saw an article this week at Paul Thorat's website that uh, I'm also running Windows 10 preview on my Nokia 830. So that's, uh, that's this little double here. Let me make sure nothing embarrassing comes up on my screen before I show it to you guys. No, nope, no, nope, that's all good. Let me clear that out so my email's not the... There we go. Um, so similar deal if you've got a Windows phone, and that's running Windows Phone 8.1, you can get the Windows... Uh, let me get my screen up here. Windows 10 preview for your Windows phone. So there's a bunch of new things in here. One of them is there's a, a new... Um, notification center here so one of the things you can do is expand the settings up there things like that um, so again very beta I've had a couple of problems with it some stuff that doesn't work very well but the process for that is very similar so go up and sign up to be a Windows Insider and that gets you permission to use it and then there is a Windows Insider app for your phone and install that and this is just like the developer preview uh, was with Windows 8 and all that. So install that app and then do uh, a uh, you know check for updates and it will upgrade your phone to Windows 10. Not sure that I would recommend that either. I've had some problems, had some weird Bluetooth problems, had some OneDrive problems. I keep uh, and it doesn't work for CRUD with my band. There's some things that work and things that don't work. So do that of your own you know, at your own risk. If you decide you don't like Windows 10 on your phone. It's a factory reset. It's an it's, there's a Nokia tool. You have to reset your phone. Excuse me, and that will put it back to 8.1. Haven't done that yet. I've considered it many times. But the good news is, when this preview first came out a month or so ago, it was only available on a few phones: the Lumia 630, 635, 638, 730, and 830. I have the 830, so I was one of the lucky five. Last week, Microsoft announced that they're going to open that beta up to more phones now, including the 920. So now I can put Windows 10 on this little devil. That's a good deal. Uh, the 920, the 1020, and the 1520. So really, you know, th this is the, the, the going to be the critical mass, the 920s, the 1020s, the 1520s. They had kind of a partition problem with that with the older phones. Looks like they've got that figured out. So if you've got a 920, a 1020, or a 1520, if you're not already signed up as a Windows Insider, do that. Uh, get that app, and then you can just start uh, checking for updates and see when you can get that upgrade. So I'll be curious to hear what uh, experience you guys have with the 920s, the 1020s, 1520s with the, uh, the Windows 10. So good stuff. Lots of fun things coming out right now. I'm very excited. In the chat room, uh, Joanne asked how many days it's been since I bought a tablet. I don't feel like answering that question, Joanne. I don't think I like your tone very much. It was for my daughter. It wasn't for me. She wanted one. She likes tablets. Gets that from her mom. Okay. Um, so here's another one that's come up a few times. And Trevor and I were chatting about this on Twitter the other night, as Trevor and I often do. Been getting some weird reports lately from various places. And it's very sporadic. There's I don't know exactly what the issue is. But with the last... Mm, three or four, so we're talking March 2015, February 2015, December 2014, maybe a little earlier. With SharePoint 2013, some folks are getting this weird registry permission error after they install one of the patches. So imagine you've got a farm that's running Service Pack 1 or something like that, and everything's churning away happily. You drop the March 2015 CU on there, and now you get these weird errors. Like one of them is the managed metadata service won't uh, start. One of them is you get a weird error when you try to view list items. And if you start poking around in the ULS log or your event viewer, you'll see an error that says requested registry access is not allowed. So... One of the things, you know, I've, uh, you know, back 100 years ago, I scripted creating a SharePoint farm and in PowerShell. And one of the things that I did with that was you had to, you know, replace all the steps of running the wizard. So we've all run the configuration wizard. You install it, you run the wizard. It sets everything up. So I had to find all of the PowerShell that did all that. One of the pieces of PowerShell 
that replaces the config wizard is one called initialize SP resource security. And what that commandlet does is goes out to a bunch of places that, that SharePoint knows it needs access to, registry keys and file locations and all that kind of stuff, and makes sure that it has permission. Okay, so we had this problem internally with a farm, and somebody said, hey, the permissions are wrong. I'm like, hey, run this. And they said, well, I ran the configuration wizard, and that fixed it, but that causes IIS resets and all that. So I'm like, well, just run the initialization, initialize SP resource security commandlet. That will fix it. And it does, and we've had it show up a bunch of times. In the There's a, a forum thread I've got linked here, a, a TechNet forum thread. Trevor suggested using a tool called Process Monitor to, to hunt down the the location of the registry key that could not be accessed. Process Monitor is a great tool. It's one of the um, Sys Internals tool that Mark Rusinovich brought over when Sys Internals was bought by Microsoft. And it is incredibly intimidating. It's scary. It's fast moving. But I promise you, if you spend like six or seven minutes playing with it, you'll figure it all out and you'll love it. But one of the things it lets you do is watch file access and registry access and all kinds of things like that. And you can only search for failures. And so if you've got something like this, it'll bubble up pretty quickly what the, the registry key is, who's trying to access it. Lets you uh, lets you troubleshoot these things a little better. So I'm curious if anybody else is having this problem. I chimed in on that thread in theory, after you install this patch and you run the configuration wizard, that should fix all the resources. So what I haven't been able to find out for certain is whether people are having these problems because like the February patches came out through Windows Update and they never ran the configuration wizard, something like that. Um, what I haven't been able to determine is if somebody's installed a patch, run the configuration wizard, everything passed, and then this problem showed up and then they have to run initialize SP resource security. So curious to hear your, your uh, stories about that if you've had it. I have not added it to my SharePoint 2013 uh, builds list yet because I just I don't know where to add it. I don't know where it came in. I don't know what the, but it might be coming out. We'll see. But again, if you've had this problem, uh, let me know so I can uh, document it accordingly. This last thing is not necessarily a SharePoint thing, <clears throat> but kind of something that I felt like uh, talking about because this is a good discussion to have. I am um, a big fan of Uber. So Uber is the 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 ride sharing thing. You know, you got the app. You tell it some dude in his car pulls up and uh, takes you where you want to go. Uber is great. I have used Uber all over the world. I've had no problems with Uber. It's almost always cheaper than a regular cab or taxi. The app lets you see where your driver's at. It just pays with your account. And so you don't have to worry about paying and the cabbie telling you that the card reader's not working and giving you the stink eye when you, you know, any none of that. The tip's built in. It is just a great experience all the way around. Can't say enough about Uber. Good things. Today I saw a story that suggested that Uber's password, username and password database had been breached and that bad guys, and nobody likes bad guys, bad guys are out on the internet selling Uber logins and that people were using them to get free rides and charge somebody else. This day and age, that, that's almost commonplace. Like once a week, somebody I do business with gets hacked and I got to go whatever. So that, um, that happens. But it made me think because something else happened in the meantime. So when this thing came out, Uber, of course, denies it and all these kind of things. So I went in, I changed my Uber password just to be safe, just in case anything happened. My Uber password has been changed. Um, it probably should have happened. It's been my that password for a while. So a couple of things about that. Every account that I sign up for with somebody, some online vendor, I give a different email address, so they're not all, you know, Todd.clin at rackspace.com or whatever. Every, excuse me, every service gets a unique email address, and every service gets a different password. Because in the past, Dropbox had this problem a while back. Somebody, uh, and I can't remember what it was, some other company got breached, and a bunch of usernames and passwords got pulled out, and some enterprising bad guy thought to try a bunch of those usernames and passwords against Dropbox, hoping that somebody was using the same username and password combination with whoever got breached as they were with Dropbox. Sure enough, they were. They found a bunch of them that fit, and they were selling them as Dropbox. You know, Dropbox has been hacked. Here's a bunch of usernames and passwords. It wasn't Dropbox that got hacked. It was somebody else. But since the usernames and passwords were the same, Dropbox people got hit. Um, so I don't use the same password for anything else. 
But the thing that kind of put this all together and made me talk about this um, in a podcast was Sunday, yeah, or Saturday, maybe it was, I was at an online retailer, and it was one that I hadn't uh, bought stuff from in a while. I'm not going to name them. I'm not going to call them out and shame them. Uh, But I hadn't bought anything there for a while, and I couldn't remember what my password was. So I did the thing where I forgot my password, typed my email address in, and I got an email from them. Now, normally what you get is, uh, hey, somebody said that you forgot your password, click this link, change your password. That's what I was expecting. That is not what I got. I got what is the scariest thing ever. They emailed me my password. <laughs> so in an email, that an email is the most insecure thing on the Internet, oh, my God, all over the Internet, un, you know, unencrypted, whatever, is the login information and the password in plain text. So this is terrifying for two reasons. Number one, because it went through the email system across the internet in plain text with both pieces of information. Somebody needs to log into that retailer and do bad things to my account. Again, it's a unique username and a unique password, but heaven knows how often that happens and it's the same username and password somebody else uses. The second thing that's terrifying about that is for them to send me my password in plain text That means they're storing it in plain text. That means it's sitting in a database somewhere, along with hundreds of thousands or millions of other username and password combinations, in plain text. So if a bad guy somehow gets in there or gets a database backup or does whatever, it's all in plain text. This is horrible. I can't... uh, I'm flabbergasted that in 2015 people still do this. So, um, had to go ahead and change that username and password also. Uh, so, but, but this kind of stuff still happens. And you never know. You don't know whether they're storing it hashed or not in the background. Because what should happen is when you change your password, they should take your password. There should be a random salt, which is something that's added to your password that is not your password, random keys or whatever. And then that should be hashed. And that's what they should store. And then the next time you sign in, you type your username, they add that random salt to it, they hash it if it matches what's in the database, they let you in. If not, you don't get in. That's what should happen. That is what not, what has not happened. Um, So I'm getting getting calls in the chat room to name and shame them. Not yet. I haven't got my stuff from them yet. Once I get my stuff, I will probably email them. And then depending on how they react to my email, I will name or shame them. So anyway, but that's terrifying. But the thing is, you never know whether somebody's doing that or not. So if you do the forgot password thing and you get the link that says change your password, that probably means it's hashed. Maybe, but maybe not. It still could be in plain text. But if you get an email from them that has your username and your password in plain text, they're storing it. They're they're either storing it in plain text or just incrementally worse is um, if they're storing it in such a way that can be unhashed. Um, so be careful with those kind of things. So here's, so I'm not just coming to you to, to tell you doom and gloom for all these things, for the Uber thing, for the plain text thing. These days you have to use some kind of password management. You just have to. And so I did on, on Twitter today, I, I asked some folks what they're using and I got three main responses. I got a few others, but three main responses. Um, last pass, and I'm going to talk about that one first because the thing I like about LastPass is it has a Windows Phone app, so that's good. So all of these things are cloud services that have apps for Windows and iOS and Android and all that kind of stuff, and they plug into your browser, they fill in your usernames and passwords. They're all very cool. It's terrifying to have all of your passwords in one spot in somebody else's spot. I get that. That's scary, but... Um, not as terrifying as some of the other things that are going on. So LastPass is one. That one got rave reviews. Another one is KeepPass, and that's another one that's very popular. And I believe that one is open source or something like that, so you can get in there, see what those guys are doing. And then the third one that people responded with a lot was 1Password, and that one is at uh, agilebits.com. LastPass is at lastpass.com. KeepPass is at keeppass. K-E-E-P-A-S-S dot info, and 1Password is at agilebits.com slash 1Password. Um, so your other options are if you've got you know Dropbox or something, you can encrypt a file and put in there. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. But 
Oh, and the other thing that I wanted to talk about was wherever possible, if you can have uh, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, you uh, you should you should try that too. So, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication is this idea that to get into something, you need uh, two things or multiple things: something you know, which is your password, click it, click, 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 and something you have. So, for instance, the something you have could be an RSA key. And yes, I realize I just showed my key, but it's going to be done in a minute, so I don't care. Um, so, something you have, something you know, and something you have, um, retinal scan or whatever. I like to think of it when I'm explaining uh, two-party or two-factor authentication to somebody like my mom. I like to explain it as something you can forget and something you can lose, but it just depends on how you look at it. Um, so a bunch of places have two-factor or multi-factor authentication. All the big cloud folks have it now. Microsoft has it for you know OneDrive and Hotmail and all that kind of stuff. Google has it. Some of them fudge the two-factor thing, and we can get into a big debate about this, but we won't. And the second factor is they will send you a text. So for instance, if you set up a new Windows 8 box, that's two-factor authentication. You sign in, you say, hey, this is my Hotmail account, and you type in your password, something you can forget, and they say, okay, we need to validate this. We're going to text your phone, give us that code. And in theory, the phone is the something you can lose or something you have. Um, and it sends you the text, you type the, the security code in. That's better than nothing. And so where you have those options, do those. Again, they're going to text you, they're going to do whatever, and that makes it that much harder for the bad guys to uh, get your password and do stuff. So, again, there's just kind of a one-two punch there, the thing that happened this weekend, and the thing uh, with Uber. Again, I don't know if Uber got breached, but my stuff's safe. I got it all, uh, got it all changed. Um, so, yeah, that's good stuff. Some stuff in the, So, a bunch of people in the chat room are using LastPass, KeePass, and all that, and they seem to be fairly happy with them. Um, all right, so I think that is it, boy, and I'm uh, I'm over. So I got to do. I, I still stick around, though, folks. I got some stuff here in uh, some new stuff in Shameless self promotion. It's been stale for a while. Uh, this year's been kind of slow for stuff with Ignite kind of collapsing some things and and all that. Uh, the Shameless self promotion has been boring. I apologize for that. Tonight, tonight is a big night. Tonight, you guys are lucky. There's some new stuff. But first. Always do this in chronological order. So the first thing is the SharePoint Evolutions Conference, which is a month from now. It's going to be over. That's kind of sad. Um, but that is in London, England. You can go to SharePointEvolutionConference.com. It's April 20th through the 22nd in London. I'm doing two upgrade sessions on Wednesday morning, and that is upgrading from SharePoint 2010 to SharePoint 2013. And I'm going to kind of be talking about... You know the process, the testing, all that kind of stuff. It's um, it's good uh, good stuff there. If you haven't signed up for the Evolution Conference and you're going to be in the UK, you should do that. If you are going to be at the Evolution Conference, for goodness sakes, come find me, shake my hand, introduce yourself. Love to talk to you. I'm very friendly, very approachable. Uh, so come up and say hey. I always love to meet new people at these conferences. Uh, the next one, a couple of weeks later, is Microsoft Ignite, and that is at ignite.microsoft.com. I'm doing two things there. Laura Rogers and I are doing a pre-conference session May 3rd on Sunday, and that is all about OneDrive for business, and it is going to be soup to nuts, everything you need to know about uh, integrating your on-prem SharePoint 2013 with OneDrive for Business. So it's the first step into that whole hybrid thing you've been hearing so much about. And it's going to be, Laura's going to be there. She's going to be handling the business user side and the end user side. I'm going to be showing you how to set the hybrid stuff up, set the on-prem stuff up. Eight glorious hours of SharePoint on-prem, SharePoint in the cloud, getting them together, um, making some uh, beautiful OneDrive for Business music with that. That will be all day on Sunday. And then later in the week, I'm going to be doing uh, that up a similar upgrade session to the one that I'm doing in the UK, only it's going to be a little shorter, and it's going to be on a, the focus of getting things ready for SharePoint 2016. You guys have heard about those already. That's boring stuff. Everybody knows about that. But I added two things here in this last week. 
The first one is my buddy Mike Robbins sent me an email and said uh, he's uh, one of the guys that runs the Mississippi PowerShell user group, and he said they were getting ready to sign, you know, get their users uh, slotted out for this year, and he wanted to know if I'd be willing to uh, to take a take a night. So I will be talking to them Tuesday, August 11th, 8:30 Central. Probably going to be doing that over law, online over the internet. So they've said they can do that stuff over link. No idea what I'm going to talk about yet. That's a long time from now. But uh, you can go out to MSP, <laughs> MSPSUG.com, the Mississippi PowerShell user group, and you can see that I'm going to be there August 11th. So if you've got some PowerShell stuff, I would like to hear what you'd like to hear about. And then finally, I got wrangled into this. This is... Uh, um, I can't. I succumbed to peer pressure. I don't know. I I looked uh, looked into somebody's. I don't know what the hell happened here. But it looks like I'm going to be going down to SharePoint Alusa, down uh, down in uh, Branson. Uh, so this is Mark Rackley's big conference, and it's SharePoint. It's music. It's like a big party. I've I've never gone to this one before. And I decided this was the year. I'm going to do it. So I'm going to be at SharePoint Alusa. That is September 18th through the uh, and the 19th. And you can go to SharePoint Alusa, spelled just like it sounds, uh, .org, and find out about that and sign up for that. Mark and I haven't decided what I'm going to talk about yet, but it'll be fun, whatever it is. And I'm, I'm a little excited. I'm a little nervous. I might not be uh, cool enough, I guess, to speak at SharePoint Alusa. That's, uh, that's a cooler crowd. It's a bigger party crowd than I'm used to. But I'm excited about that. This is the year. And, and so it's kind of funny because SharePoint Evolution and SharePoint Alusa both have been these like massive party over the top. These are the greatest conferences ever kind of thing. And I've just, for whatever reason, I've never, never gotten involved in them, never pestered those guys. And this year, uh, this year is the year. So if you're going to be down there, it's again, I believe it's in Branson, Missouri, SharePointAlusa.org. Sign up for that and uh, we'll see you down there. So thanks, everybody. That is it for tonight. That is all that I have. Got a, just a little over 40 minutes here. I will. Uh, I think I'll be back next week. I think it's going to be normal stuff. Uh, you know, and I kind of I forgot this last month was the six-year anniversary of this deal. I think I started this thing in March of 2009. So happy anniversary to the show. Thanks to everybody in the chat room. I'll stick around for a while, and, uh, and we'll chat. Thanks to you guys for listening. Again, hit me up if you've got any suggestions, at Todd Clint on Twitter, todd.clintatrackspace.com. Uh, thanks for your time, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>